Hey, everybody, I'm Angie Goff, and this is the Oh My Goff Show. For nearly two decades, I've covered big stories and big names, whether it was reporting from the royal wedding, the Super Bowl, or sitting down with the first lady. There's one thing I know for sure. Behind every headline is a human story, one filled with ups, downs, laughter, and life lessons. Each episode, we'll tap into some pretty incredible minds, people who've found true success in chasing their dream or changing the world. It's the story behind the story that I hope will inspire your own. This is the Oh My Golf Show with Angie Goff. Dr. Janelle McCauley, combat veteran, 20 years as an Air Force pilot commander. Rolling Stone, look it up. They did this feature on you on leading an all female team that planned and executed the removal of the Syrian chemical weapons. Um, and Dr. Beth Macra is number five, right? Number five to pilot the stealth bomber, right? Yeah, in the history of the B-2, we've just had 10 women fly. It's amazing that you're able to take those tactics and be able to apply them to real life. When I speak to the military where lives are on the line. If you're a leader making decisions for people, if you're an operator where your decisions need to be rational and focused in a combat environment, we don't have the luxury to be distracted. Uh, the biggest skill I always taught when I was an uh, instructor in pilot training was that compartmentalization. Take that moment, put it to the side, get to the next moment because you can't afford to mess everything up. You need to let it go and move on to the next thing. This is the Oh My Gosh Show, episode 77, but it's a special one because it's an inaugural show here on this awesome platform, uh, Fireside. Created live on Fireside. And I just thought that you two would be the perfect duo to help and pun totally intended to take off, uh, take off on this um, platform. Dr. Janelle McCauley and Dr. Beth Macros, welcome to the show. You are both cool moms, uh, also combat veterans um, and pilots together, 45 years of experience uh, serving our country and certified badasses <laughs> who really know really know what it's like to work your ass off and also know what it's like to kind of break down from all of that. And that's what we're going to get in today because I just feel like your story stories, both of them transcend the military and a lot of people will resonate with it because I just know a lot of people are feeling it, especially post pandemic, trying to get back into the swing of things. Um, and in the words of Beyonce in her new hit single, Brick My Soul, you're here to help us release your mind, release your job, release the time, release the stress, release it all. Okay, so that's what we're going to get into uh, what today. What a great intro, Angie. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, just to kick things off. But first, um, just so that everybody knows where we're coming from, I would love if you could just, each of you, tell us a little bit about your experience and how it led you to the path you are on today. Absolutely. I'll go ahead and start if that's okay, Beth. Um, I, so first of all, I want to just mention, Angie, I happen to be in Washington, D.C. Or, or Northern Virginia right now with my husband's family. And I scored some like really cool aunt, like aunt cool points with my nieces and nephews, knowing that I was meeting you because they know of you um, and uh, on Channel 5. So um, thank you so much for this opportunity and for giving me that like extra boost with the family. So um, pumped about it. Um, so most of my experience in the military, I think a lot of people will resonate with. I was trying to be a badass, no matter what hat I was wearing. If I was a parent, if I was a spouse, if I was an educator, a leader, or a pilot, I wanted to be my best self. So I spent a lot of my time with undergraduate um, students, right, at the service academy here at the Air Force Academy. And I watched the way, and, and I would love to think, you know, I'm 20 plus years removed from my experience as, as an undergraduate. And I'd like to think that it's a lot different, but in fact, it's not. It's not that much different. Our women still struggle with finding their voice. And as Janelle mentioned, you know, part of her story that finding that moment where it's, it's where did the fun go out of this? That I think is, is sadly the story we hear over and over again. And I hear that from, from young men and women here, you know, at, even at the academy that they're so excited to come to a service academy. And then at some moment, it just doesn't become fun anymore. And that's something that we want to help people kind of recognize and start to think about what could you do? What could we do changing in our mindset or changing in our culture or changing in the way we interact with other people such that uh, we can re return the joy to the work that we do? Because there's a really good reason I wanted to fly aircraft, right? I grew up my whole life around airfield. I, my dad flew fighter aircraft. I wanted to be an aircraft, but yet I reached a point in my career too where it was just... 
it was miserable and it was not fun. And it became a lot of it because I was an inauthentic leader in some ways. I was, I felt forced into behaving in certain ways that just were not authentic to me as a person. And I didn't feel like those attributes that, that we espouse were uh, uh, even allowed in the workplace in some ways. So what I do is I try and bring those, those, my three daughters or other female cadets into watching how I might behave as a senior leader at the Air Force Academy and letting them know that that's okay to show that kind of vulnerability or that kind of passion or love for the people you work with, or to show that your family comes first when you're making decisions or, you know, whatever the case may be, but to show my authentic leader side and to talk about real problems. And then let them know that that's okay if they have the same kind of things. And I'll just say, this isn't just a problem for our young women. Are the men of the, this sort of like rising generation, they want more of that, right? This is not just a f- female or male problem. This is a, this is a change in our generation. The leadership of the future does not look like the leadership of the past. Yeah. And I think that whether you wear a uniform or not, um, what you said is is so important. I mean, people have real lives, right? You know, we look at you and we see you stand in front of the cool stealth bomber or the plane. We're like, yeah, man, she kicks ass, Top Gun. Oh, cool. But at the end of the day, you know, you still have to go home, give your kid a bath, do everything else. You're you're carrying everything else. I mean, even being a news anchor, what you see on TV, you know, we come in and, and I have a saying, you know, when I walk through that studio, you see this invisible sign that says the show must go on. They don't care if you're sick. They don't care if you're depressed. They don't care if you're going through something. They don't care if you just dropped all your makeup right outside. The show must go on. And that's what people see. But behind the scenes, we all have different likes and wants and needs. And um, and I think that, you know, when people finally do sit down and take a moment to think, because how often do we just sit down to think? And that's what I wanted to ask you about, Janelle, because you did a TED Talk and there was something that really struck struck me hard you talked about giving your child a bath and how your your son looked up to you and said something and 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 that the idea of just how much our minds wander and what it does when it does that that most of our waking moments we are not paying attention to what's going on right in front of us so if you just take that at face value almost half your day your attention system, and if you kind of think of it like a flashlight, let right, it can be laser focused at what's going on externally, but our flashlight can also be laser focused internally at our thoughts, feelings, and emotions. And half our day, our attention system turns inward unintentionally. That's kind of the trick. Our minds are fantastic at mental travel, mental time travel, and they like to turn inward. It's like when you read a page in a book and you get to the bottom and you think to yourself, I don't even remember what I just read. Or you drive your car to your destination and you can't even remember the roads you took to get there. It's because you were having an off-task thought during an ongoing task or activity. And that phenomena, that distraction, is very real for many of us. And in fact, it takes us out of the moment and it takes us to our stressors and our worries, right? It's like our minds, this iPod, and we can think and fast forward and you know, plan for the future, think and rewind and reflect on the past. But what happens when stress is applied, especially overwhelming stress of uncertain environments where we kind of go into survival mode, we start catastrophizing about the future, ruminating and worrying over the past. And we do it in an unintentional way where it takes us out of the moment. And in fact, that moment with my son, I remember the talking point in my head was that, oh, I was being a badass mom and a leader and I was doing all the right things. And I was being there with him present, right? Physically present with him for bath and bedtime until he literally stopped me, put his hands on my cheeks and just looked up and said, mommy, why are you so sad? I really love you, mommy. And it was in that moment I realized that I was mentally disengaged, right? I was thinking about my worries and stressors, and I wasn't even aware that it was happening. And I was losing these opportunities for connection and joy and love and laughter and learning about one of the most important people in my life. And so that's when I really started to realize that these skill sets are very universal for every one of us, right? Whether we are just being parents, whether we are trying to excel in these high stress environments with our occupations, it's... This distraction will really ruin our relationships and our ability to be our best selves. So that's really where my skill sets drive to fix and to build um, a new foundation for people to manage through those different, different circumstances. 
I, I know there's not one secret out there because then everybody be doing it, right? <laughs> We'd all be happy. We don't, we wouldn't even need to do this podcast. Uh, but there's a reason why self-help books fly off the shelf, right? And people subscribe to Oprah magazine every month, right? We want to feel better. We want to feel happier. We want to feel fulfilled. We want to feel in some ways content. So, uh, what would be your advice to other people? What is a starting point in getting to, to that point to, to buying back some of that time? Well, I think one of the first things, you know, that we would, we would say that we learned is to be aware of those sort of moments where you're off task during an, you know, during when you really should be focused on something and then to recognize those voices that are not helpful. Um, you know, yesterday we were, we were counseling a student and she had made a mistake, a, a pretty significant mistake, but a mistake. And she just kept beating herself up. And, and the person doing the mentoring said, is that the voice in your head? Are you just repeating what that voice is telling you? And she said, I don't, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't think so. And we said, well, just sit for a second and just be aware of the thoughts that you're saying to yourself because those have real impact. And there's a, a great saying that says, if you were friends with the voice in your head, would they be a good friend? Would that be a, a helpful person to, to have a relationship with? And usually the answer is no, because you're tougher on yourself than anybody else will ever be. Um, and I, so I, re- I really think one of the first skills that you have to learn is how to identify and separate that sort of internal voice And that thing that's pulling you away and then start to recognize what are the expectations you think that other people have of you and then validate whether those are real expectations or those are just a figment of sort of what you think people think about you. Uh, My mom once said to me, if you actually knew how little people think of you, you would be shocked. They really don't think about you nearly as much as you think they do. And I, I just, it's always stuck with me. They're really not thinking about me as much as I think they are. And so anyway, that's what I would recommend. First thing is take the step to make sure you understand that that voice is not a real voice and you need to be able to identify it before it can do that serious damage. And Janelle, I know that you actually put together a, uh, a program with NFL coach, um, with the NFL coach um, with the Seahawks, Pete Carroll, uh, and something like this. And and I know meditation and being mindful, we hear that all the time, but you say those are not just buzzwords. And for people like me, where you, you know, someone tells me to go meditate, and I'm like, what am I supposed to think about? And they're like, nothing. And I'm like, how do you do that? So, but it's baby steps, right? Absolutely. So building upon what Beth was saying, really what mindfulness, which is the training that I do um, promote in a lot of my workshops and education and in my Warrior's Edge program, which I did design with uh, Pete Carroll, the coach of the Seattle He's Seahawks, as well as Dr. Michael Gervais, who's a high performance sports psychologist. So the three of us combined our efforts, each working in our own space, right? Pete was working in the NFL. Mike was working with high performers um, in elite sport. And I was working with the military and we created this program that gets after 16 principles of mindset. So 16 ways we can actually train our minds to prepare ourselves for challenging and uncertain uncertain circumstances. And, um, you know, you said that there are no tips and tricks, and I just want to reiterate that because there are none. This is hard work. I know a lot of people will say, you know, what I teach is soft skills, and why are you teaching these soft skills to the military? I will tell you some of the things we teach and we work on are the most difficult difficult, hard skills for people to really manifest into their everyday lives so that they have the impact because you have to commit. Like our brains have spent years being wired for distraction, to be wired to um, make emotional overreactions to the things that happen in our lives. So building up emotional regulation, building up being present, building up the ability to quiet your mind and not listen to the narratives and voices inside your head is extremely difficult to do. And it really does take work. The good news is our brains can change. It's called neuroplasticity. So we can rewire these aspects of how we really see the world around us. And so building on what Beth was saying with awareness, 
mindfulness training in the research is the top skill set to develop in order to create more awareness. Just like I said, when you read the page of the book, you get to the bottom and you can't remember what you read. Many times you might even have to go back five pages before you realize that was the moment I lost awareness that I was even starting to mind wander, right? So it's not something that comes quickly to many of us. Um, and so it's something we do have to work on. And mindfulness, I really equate it to this idea of doing mental push-ups because just like I talked about the flashlight in our of our attention system, we have to build mental strength to keep the flashlight focused on the play button of our mind. And so that's why it's a mental push-up when we do mindfulness training. And I think that also a lot of people understand in order to be physically fit and improve my physical health, I would do physical push-ups and I can see that difference. When I equate mindfulness to doing mental push-ups, it's doing the same thing. It's strengthening your attention system, right? To build up the mental strength to be more present and in the moment, not chasing thoughts, right? Quieting our minds. We're building up the capability of actually bringing more of our best self to each moment that we're in because we're not inside our heads. We're actually on the play button. We talk with a lot of elite operators and athletes and we say, there's really no such thing as big moments. There's just the moment you're in and you have the choice to be all in in those moments or distracted and mind wandering. And I think most of us, especially when I speak to the military where lives are on the line, if you're a leader making decisions for people, if you're an operator where your decisions need to be rational and focused in a combat environment, we don't have the luxury to be distracted. So this is a very important concept to, to kind of start to incorporate into your everyday life. Yeah. And, and you talk something about like just taking a minute, right? A minute a day or start there. Yes. In fact, would you guys like to try a mindful minute? I can kind of teach your viewers how to do it. Yes. Okay, so backing up a little bit into the research, we want to get about 10 minutes. Right, so 10 minutes of mindfulness training or mental push-ups a day is really the sweet spot in the research for the maximum benefit. Now you can do this two different ways. You can do all 10 minutes in one sitting. So say you wake up in the morning, you do 10 minutes of mindfulness training, mental push-ups, right? And then it, la it should last you most of the day. I tend to be somewhat of an anxious, highly anxious person, just the life that I live and my past traumas. So I have found that if I just do those 10 minutes in the morning by about two, three o'clock and maybe Maybe some parents on the call will recognize this. Right about when it's two, three o'clock, when I have to pick up my kids from school, like a lot of my mindful awareness has ceased to exist anymore. So what I've found is when I do 10, one minute mindful minutes throughout the day, I can increase the mindful awareness that I'll experience. So that's why I like to teach people the mindful minute technique. It's also something that, you know, it has a beginning, it has an end. It's something that you can almost do anywhere, right? You can even do it at a red light. You can do it while you're walking. It's an exercise with our minds, not with our bodies. We can do one when we first wake up and they're great transition points for when you're leaving work and going home or you pull into the garage. I always let my kids go inside and I'll do a mindful minute in the car before I walk in and then engage in that space. Because really what we're training with these mindful minutes is the ability to live where our feet are planted. How many of us spend all day at work thinking about all the things we're messing up at home? Or we spend our time at home with our kids thinking about all the things that are stressing us out at work. It's, it gives us the ability to delineate when where we're at so that we can live on the play button and, and really live where our feet are planted. So the way you'll do a mindful minute this is a mental exercise. It's not like a meditation where you want to kind of fall asleep. So we want to be alert during the practice. So I ask if we kind of keep our feet flat on the ground, wherever you're at, maybe place your hands in a symmetrical position, either um, palms up, palms down, or hands clasped. Um, you can leave your eyes open or closed. If you're driving and happen to be listening to this, I would not recommend closing your eyes, <laughs> but your eyes can be open or closed. If you do leave your eyes open, maybe channel your attention down the bridge of your nose to a point a couple of feet in front of you, just to limit any di visual distractions around you. So we are going to take one minute of focusing on our breathing. So I want you to pick a particular sensation, maybe the way the air goes in and out of your nostrils or the rise or fall of your belly or chest for an entire minute. Right now, in the span of a minute, your attention system will be focusing on your breath and it will start chasing a thought, right? That flashlight's going to start flipping. The idea is bringing awareness to the thought in your head, 
letting it go and refocusing right back on your breath. Every time your mind gets distracted and you refocus, you are doing a mental push up, strengthening your attention system to be on the play button. All right, are we ready to begin? All right, let's take a nice deep inhale. Exhale, try to kind of relax through your shoulders, but lift through your head. Ready and begin. And stop. All right, how many push-ups did you guys do? <laughs> I'm ready for a nap. No. <laughs> uh, yeah, Hillary, Bruce, all of you, uh, Jet, Riza, Jen, all of you, uh, I hope you did that. You know what I noticed, though? Well, the whole time, I, I can I just tell you how where I wandered? I was like, oh, my gosh. I was like, what if people leave the room because we're you know sitting here closing our eyes? They think we're asleep. What if, what if you know, people are watching, like my brother-in-law, and they think that I'm stupid? You know, all of a sudden, like you said, your mind just goes to all these negative things. And then all of a sudden, as I just started to refocus, I realized I was, like, tense, you know? It was just, like, my body, like, it's just yeah. tense. I, I don't know. It's funny when you just sit for a moment and just realize... Angie, I, I, I feel the same way. That's the same kind of thing I do. Like, oh, are people looking at me? And then I remind myself, nobody's <laughs> looking at you. Are you looking at anybody else? Do you care about anybody? Like, I think it's so fascinating. Just the recognition of that voice or mm -hmm. that recognition of that fear or whatever. That for me is probably the, the best thing that you can start to recognize in the, okay, that was silly. Of course, that doesn't make sense. Of course, your brother-in-law who cares for you tremendously is not going to leave the room because there were 60 seconds of quiet time. Yeah. Oh, well, see, definitely. You know what I mean? But that that whole recognition, that moment of just the discomfort because you were worried about someone else, I think is you know, I think that really is critical when you start to think about now, what do I now want to do? What? How do I want to bring myself or show up in this space? This should be a, a note, right? Like a lot of what we do in these skill sets is giving us little messengers to help us reflect on how we can improve. And I would say this should just be the note that you are 100% normal because most human beings will have those same thoughts in your head. But now here's, here's what I hope you take away from it is that one minute, right? And if you can try to do a couple of these one minute sessions a day, the more you'll practice it, the more it will create that awareness for you so that you can realize when those thoughts are taking you outside of the moment into other places, mostly negative ones. And so that you can catch yourself sooner because I would say I, I'm an avid practice a practitioner of this but I still get carried away by my thoughts too right I'm a human being but what I found that this skill set does for me is that I catch myself sooner saying ah that's not a real thought like right this is just something my mind is creating and I'm gonna it's a stressful thought that I'm just gonna let go and then I have a skill set to refocus on my breath so I hope that that becomes valuable to you yeah yeah and um and I think I need to go to the chiropractor I just said <laughs> There's a lot of a lot of stress, you know, when you really just take a moment to realize what your body's going through and, and feels like. Um, but that's really, like you said, I mean, that is really an easy tip. And I know that with creating Lift, your show that you run through different scenarios. I mean, this is what you're about it. And you guys are moms and you're, you're doing it all. And that's the thing is, you know, so many people, I never know what to say when people look at me and they're like, I don't know how you do it. And and uh, wow, it's amazing. And and it's just like, I, I kind of want to retreat because inside, I don't feel like I'm doing it all. You know, I don't, I feel like, I, I told somebody the other day, I walked through the newsroom and I was like, where are my hose at? And I was like, I feel like a firewoman. I'm putting out fires, you know, every day. Cause it is, you know, you're doing the news and then I'm setting up play dates, canceling this and just you, your brain never. And I know that some people might have some questions. Well, we have a request to speak. Here we go. It's our friend, Jen O'Donnell. Come up to the stage, Jen. Hello. Thank you so much for that guided meditation. I really needed it. I, uh, this is a silly question, but I, <laughs> I forget to be mindful. <laughs> like I always have the intention of, of taking moments like that. Do you have any tricks or tips about, you know, just ways to, to keep it fresh on your mind? Like I, I would ignore the post-it note, you know? <laughs> like So I won't say it's a tip or trick. This is, this is something you're going to have to actually really commit to. So how often do you pick up your phone and just mindlessly scroll? And then you gain awareness that, oh my gosh, I've been on Facebook for like five minutes just scrolling and I didn't even realize I was doing it. So here's my suggestion. 
is every time, once you catch yourself doing something mindlessly, grabbing a bag of potato chips and just eating to the bottom, picking up your phone, mindlessly scrolling on social media, put your phone down and do a mindful minute. There's actually a a psychology research behind this. It's called temptation bundling. Before you do something that you want to do, that's really not much value added to your life, do something you need to do, which is that mindful minute. So that's one way to kind of pair and start to create habit patterns around this practice. Another technique that I use with my children, I don't know if any of you had these kind of mornings where it's like your teenage daughter's grumpy, your son can't find his shoes, you get in the car, they're bickering in the back seat, like you hit every red light on the way to school, you pull up to the school and you say, get out of the car. Oh, but have a great day. Mommy loves you, right? And it's like, it's 7.15 and we're already anxious and stressed out. So what we also do is we have a trigger point on the commute to school. We call it the blue house with the sunflowers and it's our mindset reset point. That's where we all do two deep breaths and set an intention for the day. So it's about creating some habit patterns and then also gaining that awareness. I love that. Thank you, Jen, for that question. And remember, you can just hit the request button for our in-studio audience if you have a question. Um, We would love to pull you up on the stage. Uh, I wanted to ask just, um, you know, becoming a pilot. um, I I don't know. To me, that's so amazing because uh, in, a, in a combat pilot for both of you. I mean, this is something that you all thought from a young age was really, really possible because I, I mean, I remember I used to want to be in the NBA, but there was no there was no WNBA. There was just no way there. There was no pipeline to it during that time. Then, you know, obviously I never grew and then I never was able to really jump. So it didn't work out. It didn't pan out. Um, I didn't get into the West Point Military Academy either, but we won't talk about that. That's for another day. Uh, but, you know, Failure. We like to talk about failure. You know, we all succeed in one way or another. But, but just, um, just the story of being a pilot, and you know, and what led you up to that point. Yeah, I'll go ahead first in this one. So, like I said, I grew up around airfields. My dad was in the Air Force, and so I sort of knew. But the trigger for me to want to do it was actually not at all my desire to fly aircraft. It was actually a comment someone made to me on an airfield when I was a younger, uh, I think I was around like eight years old or 10. And it was somebody that said, I said, I want to fly those aircraft. And I pointed at a fighter aircraft, which my dad flew. And he said, oh, Ooh, no, girls don't. We don't let girls do that. They can fly these planes over here. And he pointed at a, 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 a large aircraft, a, a, what we call heavy aircraft. And I remember thinking in that moment, like, that is the stupidest thing I have ever heard. Who would care if you're a male or a female? It's not like when you pull the stick, the aircraft knows that it's a male or a female controlling the plane, right? And even in my youth you know, my young brain, I knew that that doesn't really make sense. That's more of a cultural issue. But because of that, and what tends to motivate motivate me, and I know there's a lot of people out there that are the same way, is motivating the, I'm going to show you that I can. I'm going to show you that I can, in fact, do that. And so that's what sort of sent me down that path, which was, I want to sort of build that pathway, and I want to be able to build that pathway for other people, and I want to show those you know, some, sometimes ignorant people that they are way off base. And so that led me down that path. And, and then when you get into the flying, it's like any other really, really difficult and challenging skill. You have to be able to one compartmentalize when you fail or when you succeed, when you're flying an aircraft and you're set to fly, say for an hour, you might have 30 skills that you're going to work on in, in, on that sortie. You'll probably mess most of them up or not do them perfectly, right? There's no such thing as a perfect flight, we like to say. But you've got to get over that mistake so that you can get onto the next one. What we see often happen, and this is true for anything, it starts when it starts to snowball when you make mistakes and then you just you can't let go of that mistake to get to the next point. And and then it just snowballs into this really horrible flight for you or this horrible sortie. And so the the biggest skill I always taught when I was an instructor in pilot training was that compartmentalization. Take that moment, put it to the side, get to the next moment because you can't afford to mess everything up. You need to let it go and move on to the next thing. And I think that's a really critical skill um, that we learned in pilot training, which was failure, letting it go so you can move to the next thing and then learning to deal with it. Once you've got on the ground, 
once you started your debrief so that you could, okay, let me learn from this mistake, not take it as a personal attack on me as a human being, but treat it as a, I am learning these skills and, you know, just keep showing back up. And one of the things we talk about is sort of like the grit and the resilience to come back again and again. Yeah. Be, be proactive, not reactive. I like that. Yeah. And, uh, and, and Janelle, for you, I, I know your father, didn't he have a big role in you becoming a pilot? He did. He did. So I distinctly remember, even as young as the age of seven, my dad, he was a police officer, and he would tell anyone, any stranger that would listen if I was around, that his daughter was going to grow up to be a combat pilot or a submarine warfare commander. And this, or this was the 1980s, right? So women couldn't do those jobs. And so I really grew up not realizing that there was even limitations on what I could achieve as a female, which is really empowering. And I think it's so important as parents that we use the right messaging with our children so that they can see a possible. It's definitely was formative for me to have that experience with my dad. Um, you know, he also introduced me to the movie Top Gun. Uh, we talked a little bit about it on our podcast the other day. And that was something too, where I kind of had that, wait, dad, but there aren't women flying these planes. And I remember he said to me, just because you can't see it, that mean that it can't be possible for you. And that's really guided me uh, going into the conversation around failure that Beth, Beth, you know, kind of alluded to is that you have to realize that failure is where growth and learning occurs. Um, if you see failure as this definition of your self-worth, you are really going to struggle in anything you attempt because anything worth doing and anything worth trying to do to the best of your ability is going to require some mistakes learning and growth in the process. And so if you're, if you don't want to see the edges of your potential and what you can do, right? Like you're not going to step outside your comfort zone. But if you're someone that really wants to see, can I be a combat pilot? Can I train the military in mental push-ups? And everyone thinks you're kind of a crazy person for even, you know, uh, 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 approaching the subject, right? Like you have to have a, a lot of mental strength to push through the failures and see them as opportunities to maybe even pivot and try different tactics to get to the end goal. I'm going to call up. Let's see here. I'm going to try to do this. Um, I'm, I'm inviting um, Bruce. I'm inviting you to speak because you always have, you know, thoughts on different things. And I know that um, you might have some questions. Hey, Ken, can you hear me? Yeah. Hey, hey, Betty. Thanks for joining us. Hey, how are you? <laughs> Absolutely. It's you read my mind. Beth, what you said uh, really struck a note with me because my son is playing football at JMU. And I mean, these are highly charged guys. And what you said really applies from one play to the next. They could have an awful play and the coaches are there and everyone's charged up and he's saying, shake it off. And you've got to shake it off for the next play. And that is so counterintuitive to do. <laughs> yeah. It really is a tough scout, uh, skill, Bruce. I totally agree. Uh, I help out with the women's soccer team here. Um, Division one, uh, you know, women's soccer. These are high performing uh, young ladies. And we, we say you're going to make a hundred mistakes and then one great play. And like, that's how that's going to go out. And, and I think that's a great way for them to think, you know, to prepare for future leadership. It's like, I'm gonna make a hundred mistakes and then I'm gonna do something amazing. And I need to be okay with that. Um, I, I do see a, a lack of, um, wanting to fail as this generation sort of comes up as this, you know, this, this, this set of college age kids that I teach. Uh, and so I am worried about that. Do we give them space to fail so, and know that it's okay? I think that might not be how they, you know, the, the world that they saw as much as we would like and that we need. All right. Thanks, Bruce. Wait, Top, Top Gun, did you guys see the new one? <laughs> we did. Like I thought it was very authentic and connected to the original. I will say as a pilot, you had to go in with like this idea of like, this is just entertainment. I mean, we had, we had Phoenix in there, right? And that was a great benefit to see a female and some more diverse um, characters. Yeah. I had friends that watched it and they were like, man, you watch that movie and it just makes you proud to be an American. And I was like, okay, all right. I have a lot catching up to you. I got to watch Thor. I got, you know, the kids too, the minions, but I'm going to get to Top Gun. I promise it's, it's, it's on the list. What would you say, um, cause you, you talk about the messaging to our children and, um, and then the inner battle of, you know, the guilt that's involved, like the moment 
with the bathtub in your son, Janelle. Um, so how do we find a, a balance with that? How do we justify it really? Um, one of the reasons I think Beth and I called our show Creating Lift and it's modern mentorship for, for leaders and that's leaders in all aspects of our lives, right? As parents and family leaders and, and leaders in our profession. Um, I like to say mentorship is really helping someone else figure out their own way um, because just because something works for me and the way that I work with my kids doesn't mean it's going to absolutely work for everyone else. So I like to give some skill sets that then you can try in your own life because the most important thing is that what's going to work for you is the thing you're going to actually do and commit to, right? And so that's why if you want to do, if 10 minutes in the morning of practicing mental push-ups is better or those one minute intervals throughout the day, I want you to try it different ways. There are also different ways to breathe in those minutes that we didn't even get to today, but um, it's more about trying to incorporate things in your life that will actually help you. Um, so for me, I would say the other aspect of what has helped me be a better parent and, and really embrace these skills is in let, letting go of this idea of balance and embracing instead the word harmony. In fact, I have a personal philosophy. It's like what I live by and I call it my five L's and they're labor, laugh, love, learn, and lead. And the reason why I have these five L's is not that I balance them every day. I just harmonize them. So if I get to the end of the day and I say, you know, um, I, for many years of my life, I would just say, man, I worked really hard. I had a lot of laboring today. Like, and I feel pr pretty proud of myself, but then I missed every opportunity for laughter and love and learning. Even when I wasn't there all the time with my kids, the moments I was there, I was so distracted and, and in my stress and in my work. And so I use my five L's to remind myself, and actually I use it with my kids at night. We go over them and we say, did we lead today? Did we love today? Did we laugh today? If we didn't laugh, the tickle monster comes out, right? Did we learn something? And sometimes my young son will say something like, well, I learned not to step on other people's shoes, right? Whatever it is for him. Um, and did, did we love um, and, and did we focus on the most important aspects in a very harmonized, not balanced way? And in fact, um, my son, he shares my L's with me, although he has a six L and he calls it listen. So that's what he focuses on um, throughout his day is, is really harmonizing, doing it every single one of those things, not in equal parts, but just making sure we hit them all. So I encourage everyone to kind of figure out how they can bring that presence in their life, how they can incorporate these mindful minutes so that they can live more where their feet are planted and develop those deeper relationships with the moments they have with the special people. And I know that you mentioned we didn't even get to some of the exercises and so forth, but that's okay because uh, Creating Lift is your show that's on Fireside as well as YouTube. And so Beth, in closing, anything you'd like to add in addition to where we can find both of y'all anytime we need to? Yeah, I would just re remind people that success is what you decide it is. It doesn't have to conform to any standard. And so, I, you know, uh, I learned this when I first got married. Every successful marriage looks different, but every dysfunctional one looks the same. And so sometimes when you're trying to fit yourself into something that's just not natural or just doesn't work for you and your family, that's where you get yourself into some of these, you know, trouble spots. And so just recognize that sometimes different things work for different people and you define success and then what leads you down that path or how you decide to, you know, execute mindfulness or whatnot. That has to be unique to yourself, but you'll have to try it out many ways and, and fail and make mistakes. And then eventually you can find what works for you. Uh, creating Lift, when can we, um, when can we watch it? So it's on Thursday nights at 7 p.m. Mountain. We have a YouTube channel that it will stream as well as here on Fireside and on the firesidechat.com website under both our names. Um, additionally, I have a website, JanelleMcCauley.com, if anyone's interested in learning more information about the work that I particularly do, especially with my Warrior's Edge program with high-stress occupations. Um, and uh, Beth and I are both on all the social media channels if you want to uh, reach out to us. Well, Angie, I do have one thing I have to say. Being a, an active duty military member, I do need to say that all of the opinions are my own, not reflective of the Department of Defense, Department of the Air Force, or the United States Air Force Academy. Yes, or the Commander-in-Chief. We got it all. We got to we got to cover ourselves. Uh, no, I really do appreciate both of you guys coming on and being just so open and so personal. And, and above all, um, Dr. McCauley and Dr. Macros, just helping all of us that are watching and even our in-studio audience do what you really want to do. And that's take people to new heights personally and professionally. So a big thank you to you and also for your wonderful service to our country. Thank you, Angie. This has been really fun.